Well, good evening. Um, how many of you need notes? If you need any notes, please uh, raise your hands, and we'll have the ushers uh, get the notes to you, so keep your hand up. And for those of you who are ready to go, go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. John 14. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we ask you that you would open up our eyes to your law. Lord, that we would see new things, Father, concerning your heart and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John 14. What, uh, what I want to do tonight, I just want to um, just give a, a somewhat of a overview, just really, really just kind of like a 50,000-foot perspective on on John uh, 14. You know, John 13 to 17 is what um, uh, we started on uh, several months ago. And now we're focusing on John 14. And we just kind of see uh, where the Lord um, is going to take us. But uh, we really believe that uh, John 13 to 17 is just a real, uh, some real key passages that the Lord is wanting to unlock uh, uh, in this hour uh, for the church. And that there is much gold. It says in Revelation uh, 3, the Lord says, come and buy from me gold. There's, a, there's much gold uh, to be purchased, to be received uh, from the Lord in these passages. Uh, for me personally, it's been uh, uh, one, if not my favorite passages uh, of Scripture. And when I think about the Word of God, you know, I think of the Scripture almost like this vast ocean. And, uh, and as you know, when you, you know, fly over the ocean, you see that the, uh, ocean has different shades of blue. And that, uh, where the, the blue is kind of light, the, it means it's kind of shallow. And then as it gets darker, it means it gets deeper. And then there's just parts where it's just really this deep, dark blue color because of the depths of the ocean. And so when I think of John 13 to 17, I think of this deep, dark blue part of the ocean just because there is so much to be found there as it is the really the uh, uh the best teacher that ever lived giving us instruction on how to engage with the father son and the holy spirit i said all that to say this that uh i'm just want to i'm not even just going to give an overview of this past i'm just going to give like a kind of a, just a fifty thousand foot perspective um, of this chapter, but it is worthy of just kind of coming down a few more thousand feet just to get more insight and, and, and then to get closer into what it is that's being said here. Uh, paragraph uh, A of page one, the primary theme that Jesus uh, is speaking of to his disciples in John 13 to 17 is the subject of God's love and God's glory. And so the main objective there is to lead us into the revelation of God's divine love. And I think that that's the main theme there of John 13 to 17 is to discover just the vastness of God's love. The, uh, the apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, he talks about the width, the length, the depth, the height, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And I think that uh, John 13 to 17 gives us some insight into the surpassing greatness of the uh, 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 of the love of God. We discover uh, the revelation of God's love for God, the the love of the Father for the Son, the love of the Son for the Father, uh, the God's uh, the Father's love for us, and that God the Father loves us the exact same way that He loves His Son, and that the Son loves us in the exact same way that He loves His Father. And then one of the most powerful uh, truths is John seventeen twenty six that as we uh, encounter this realm of love and glory and beauty, the result is that we as the people of God will love God in the exact same way that God loves God. And so many, many themes that are being covered in John 13 to 17, but I believe that the main theme is the revelation of God's love and um, and and God's uh, and God's beauty. Secondly, with that is that we discover that our destiny as human beings, as the redeemed, that our destiny is to 
uh, is to live and to dwell and interact in what I like to call the divine community. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the divine community. And I believe actually that one of the things I think the Lord is wanting to help us with by His Spirit is to begin to understand and appreciate the importance of the Trinity. All too often, the Trinity has been relegated to uh, this academic, scholarly, type heavy theological ways of thinking. And as a result, uh, many of us have concluded that it's just an academic subject and we've missed the power and the devotion that awaits us when we begin to interact with God in that Trinitarian way. Because the thing that's so amazing about the Trinity, one scholar says that the Trinity is the divine community of single action. It, 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 it is this divine family that the Father was always interacting with His Son. The Son was always interacting with His Father in deep and profound enjoyment. The Spirit doing the same thing. I mean, I mean imagine that all throughout eternity, eternity past, you know, it says in the scripture that from everlasting to everlasting you are God. And so in eternity past, the Father and the Son and the Spirit were in deep, intimate fellowship, delight. It says in Proverbs 8.30 that, uh, that they were rejoicing before one another. They were enjoying one another, that they were delighting in, in one another. And somewhere in that dynamic, somewhere in that interaction, this uh, the councils of the Godhead... Uh, they determined to make human beings and that their destiny is to enter into that exact same relationship. To be swallowed up, to be caught up in the fellowship, to be wrapped up in that divine community. The, uh, uh, the Apostle John, in um, 1 John 1, 4, he says, and he says, a truly our fellowship He's talking to the church there in Ephesus, and he tells them that that which we have seen, handled, and touched, talking about the Lord Jesus, he says, we have proclaimed Jesus to you that you might have fellowship with us. But in here in chapter 1, verse 4, he defines the fellowship, 1 John 1, 4, as truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so he says, look, we've preached Christ to you to bring you into this Trinitarian fellowship. Paragraph B, as love in the culture and in the world continues to grow cold, uh, understanding the Trinity as our model and intimately engaging the divine community becomes absolutely important. You know, Jesus says that um, that the love of many will grow cold. And uh, I said this before, the thing that uh, never ceases to amaze me is that I never thought that, that cold love would look this passionate. I never thought that cold love would look anything but cold, but yet the scripture looks at it as what is happening within the culture is cold love. And, and the way to overcome that is by connecting with the revelation of God's divine love as seen in the Trinity. Now, before looking into John 14, I, I have to touch on John 13, just because John uh, 14, really the rest of John you know, 13 and 17, is so anchored in what is happening there in John 13. We don't have time to go through John 13, but I do want to mention a couple of things just to kind of uh, 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 see how John 13 connects to what is happening in John 14. Now, John 13 is a prophetic parable that unveils the understanding of God's humble love. Uh, there's a whole lot more going on in John 13 than meets the eye. Uh, the Lord himself said this to, his, uh, to, he said it to Peter. He says, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. In, in other words, there's a whole lot more going on than, than a foot washing service. There's many, many things about the character and the personhood of God that is being revealed there in John 13. Namely, that God himself is a servant. That the Father is a servant, the Son is a servant, the Holy Spirit is a servant. That the Father is, in fact, the servant of the Lord, the servant of Yahweh. And that this, this humble servanthood actually exists 
within the Trinity. And then Jesus, of course, makes the point. He says that the same nature of the relationship, this humble love that exists among the Father and the Son and the Spirit, he says, in the same manner we have loved you, and therefore in the same manner love one another. Paragraph D, Jesus' humility is revealed in the cross. In fact, let's go to paragraph E. John 13 is deeply connected to John 14 in that John 13 points towards Jesus' preparation on the cross to provide for us access to the Father's house. To say it, let me say it differently. In the ancient world, and we'll talk about it just a little bit more in just a few moments, but just in general, in the ancient world, it was a matter of hospitality that if you went into uh, someone's house, in particular a person of status, that person of status would have servants. And oftentimes it was the lowest of servants that would wash the feet of the guests who would enter into the master's house. And that is precisely what is happening here. Because Jesus is about to talk in John 14 about the Father's house. And so there is a matter of hospitality where he, Christ, the servant of all, who's washing the feet of his guests as they enter into his Father's house. And they're deeply connected. Now ultimately... John 13 really is talk. ultimately it is talking about uh, 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 the servanthood of Christ. I won't say ultimately because there's many more things. But one of the primary things of John 13 is that it is the, it is the servanthood of Christ plays out in his death and his suffering on the cross. It says in Mark chapter 10 verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the servanthood of Christ there in Revelation, in Revelation 13, in John 13, uh, reveals the servanthood of Christ as seen in the cross to prepare a people to enter into the Father's house, John 14. Now, the foot washing, back to paragraph E, uh, was a significant part of the culture of the ancient world, including the ancient uh, Near East. And so uh, when they would read this passage about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, this really touched the people at that time. They, they really are feeling the impact of what, uh, is, what is being taught here. Now, foot washing uh, was practiced in three specific ways. That relate, I believe, to a few key themes in John 13 to 17. Paragraph F. Number one, foot washing was practiced as a means of hospitality, as we just talked about. A means of hospitality where the servant of the house would wash the feet of the visitors. And so John 14 the Father's house, John 13, the Father, excuse me, the, the servant Jesus is washing the feet of his Father's guests, you and me, to be able to have access to the Father's house. And it's through, and, and the way that he washed our feet is through his shed blood. As he died on the cross, he washed our feet that we might have access to the, uh, uh, to the Father's house. Number one. Number two, foot washing was also utilized in the context of friendship. It's where friends, they express love and commitment to one another. And isn't it interesting that in John 15, 13, Jesus looked at the disciples and says, I call you friends. And so when he's washing the feet of his disciples in John, uh, John 13, number one, it is him as a humble servant washing the feet of his disciples to enter into the Father's house, number one. But number two, it is also the washing of the feet of his disciples because he's making a statement to them. I am your friend. You are my friend. I love you and I'm deeply committed to you. In fact, I'm so committed to you. Here it is again, John 14, 15, uh, 13. That no greater love is there than this than a man were to lay down his life for his friends. Lastly, the uh, foot washing also happened in the context of temple worship, which again, um, when talking about the Father's house, uh, Mike covered this in the last uh, several sessions. 
the uh, the father's house in, in in the context of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is the temple of God. Where and, and again, in this case, in the ancient world, they would wash the feet of those before they would enter into that place of worship. Let's go to page two. Page two. Let not your hearts be troubled. Now Jesus, he, uh, uh, in John 14, verse 27, he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It's near the end of the chapter, uh, but the chapter starts out with the same, uh, not just the exhortation, it actually starts out with the commandment uh, to not be troubled, to not be afraid. And so that is, I would say, is the burden of John 14, it is to equip the heart of the apostles, but ultimately to equip the end time church of how to live without a troubled heart, to live a a heart without fear, uh, to live without anxiety in light of the pressures that are uh, coming uh, to the earth. Paragraph A, uh, Jesus prophesied, that there is coming a time of great pressure on the earth. And in those days, many will be gripped with four predominant negative emotions. And um, uh, these emotions are fear, offense, uh, lust, and deception. Fear, offense, lust, and Deception, this acronym FOLD can go with that. Fear, offense, uh, lust, and deception. But the point is, is that these negative emotions, they happen because, uh, they happen with a heart that is disconnected uh, from Jesus in the following ways. Disconnected from Jesus in prayer, number one, and number two, disconnected from Jesus in regards to his plan or his narrative, uh, uh, his divine agenda, what it is that he is up to. Because the more we understand the prophetic scriptures, when things continue to take place that take place around us, we begin to have a, a different interpretive grid because we're able to interpret what is happening based upon what the scripture says therefore giving us confidence in God's leadership and keeping us in that place of of peace. And so one of the reasons why um, there will be many that will be gripped with these four negative emotions, fear, offense, deception, and lust, is because of being disconnected, living disconnected from the Lord in that deep, vibrant interaction with him through prayer and fellowship, as well as not uh, a, 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 a growing inner understanding of God's a divine plan or the storyline of heaven. A paragraph B, um, a Jesus in Matthew 24, he addressed three distinct emotional dynamics which include a deceived heart. Instead of deceived, we can say confused. A heart that is confused, that a heart that lacks clarity about uh, what is going on and therefore unable to make uh, 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 wise decisions in the midst of the pressure <clears throat> that is taking place. And so Jesus addresses these distinct emotions. Number one, he addresses the issue of a troubled heart. And that's what we're going to spend most of our time looking at in just a moment in light of John 14, a troubled heart. Number one, a troubled heart, I believe, leads to a cold heart. A troubled heart leads to a cold heart, and a cold heart ends up a confused heart. I'll say this again. A troubled heart, a heart weighed down with anxieties, fear, worry, uh, ends up a cold heart. Um, Worry and anxiety, I really believe that it snuffs out the uh, the word of God in our hearts. It snuffs out the uh, 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 the work of God in our hearts if we continue to yield to uh, a worry and anxiety. There's an unfortunate thing that 
has happened over time, and that is that worry has been treated as a personality trait. Uh, but it's not. Uh, to put it plainly, worry is a sin. Uh, Jesus said, do not worry. It, it, it's, it's an imperative. It is a commandment. Uh, a lot to be said about, about the, the nature of worry, but the real nature of worry at the end of the day is where we have more confidence, for lack of better terms, in our leadership than the confidence in the leadership of the Lord. And, um, you know, Jesus, the anecdote that Jesus, one of the anecdotes that Jesus gives for worry is Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. And so the way that I think about worry, worry is when we pursue the things that God said he would add. Say this again. Worry is when we, when we go after the thing that God said he would add. He said, look, seek me first and these things will be added. What anxiety does is we seek the thing that he said he would add. In other words, we're seeking to do what God's, we're seeking to do God's part. And so Jesus gives a very strong warning. He says, uh, see to it in Matthew 24. He says, see to it that you're not troubled. Uh, Matthew 24, Jesus shows th- this very important progression. Now, paragraph C, the burden of Matthew 24 is deception. I believe that the burden, uh, the, the, the message in Matthew 24 is see to it that you are not deceived. And this uh, shows up four times in Matthew 24. Then verse 4, 5, 11, and verse 24. However... Worry and anxiety, I believe, become a seedbed for deception. In other words, and I'm not talking about a feeling of anxiety. We all deal with feelings of anxiety, feelings of uncertainty. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where, where that becomes our internal way. Where inwardly, the inward narrative, the thing that drives us inwardly, the thing that drives the inward conversation is, is when it's fueled by uh, worry and anxiety. That's the thing that Jesus is warning us about. I don't want anyone walking away going, I felt anxious today and like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get deceived tomorrow. That's not, that, is, that is not what uh, we're talking about. We're talking about where our way is the way of anxiety, the way of, of worry. So Matthew 24, that is the, the primary burden. It's to not be deceived, but that worry and anxiety, when we are given into fear, our hearts actually become vulnerable, I believe, to all manner of confusion. So Jesus warns us, paragraph C, he warns us about deception, but he commands us not to be troubled. That's the point I'm trying to make. He, he warns us about deception, But he commands us not to be troubled. In fact, it says in Luke 21, verse 26, that anxiety and fear will be so great that the hearts of many would fail because of it. The the physiological effects of fear the hearts of many would actually fail them because of fear. Why am I talking about this? Because two days before the Lord's Supper, John 13 is the Lord's Supper, is when Jesus is speaking to his disciples about this issue of deception and not being troubled. It's two days before John 13. He's on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 24. And he's talking to them about this. Now, what is the connection with um, the issue of being troubled? Well, he prophesies to them two days before John 13 and then John 14. Two days before John 13 and 14, he prophesies to them about a military conflict uh, 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 across the nations. Military conflict, racial conflict, pestilences or diseases, viruses, earthquakes, betrayal, Martyrdom. So he's talking about there is pressure 
that is coming to the earth. Matthew uh, chapter 24, uh, verse 6 and 7. He says, this great pressure that is coming. And then Jesus says, one of my favorite verses, he says, guess what, guys? There's going to be wars, famines, rumors of wars. There's going to be pandemics. There's going to be earthquakes. Matthew 24, verse 6. But don't worry, guys. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, wow. He says, no, no, don't worry. He says, don't be troubled. I remember, um, you know, um, you know, here we are with COVID-19 and all the things that are happening and Afghanistan and bless you. And uh, um, Iran and Russia and all these different things. And, you know, and I'm sure the same happens with you. You know, people would ask you, say, hey, so what is happening in Iran? What do you think? You think we're going to go to war? And I go, I, I, I don't know. Well, don't you think this and this and this? I go, well, here's what I, I don't know that, but here's what I do know. Jesus said, whether it is a war or a rumor of war, the response is the same. Don't worry. <laughs> because that is the thing that we need to be more concerned about, about not being concerned. <laughs> right? We need to be more concerned about not being concerned. He said, and then because Jesus said, for these things must take place. He says, and in the end, it's not yet. And that's another thing that we got to watch is that he says, you will see these things and the end is not yet. In other words, there's something way, 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 way more intense on the horizon other than the birth pangs, though the birth pangs will be pretty intense themselves. So two days before the Lord's Supper, Jesus prophesied these things to them and he calls them to a life of peace. John 14, two days later, Jesus shows them how to walk out Matthew 24, 6 and 7. So two days before, he tells them, hey guys, here's the pressures that are coming. Don't worry, don't be given over to fear. Two days later, they're at the Lord's table, John 13, John 14, he begins to instruct them Line upon line, how to live victoriously in peace and quietness of heart and rest in the Lord. The remedy for anxiety, simply said, is fellowship with the Lord, intimacy with the Lord, devotion to the Lord, speaking with the Lord, whatever term we want to use, but it is the cultivating of our relationship with the Lord that is the primary remedy to anxiety. Paragraph E, John 14, Jesus is equipping the disciples, and I believe ultimately the end time church, who through deep fellowship with the Trinitarian fellowship will walk confidently in righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, peace, and joy. John 14 actually equips our hearts of how we can have relationship with the Father to strengthen our hearts by his power, by his presence, by his grace, that in the greatest of pressures, we can still walk confidently in righteousness, peace, and joy. There's a very uh, unusual passage that's... Uh, in Ezekiel 14, 21. Ezekiel 14, 21 and 22. Uh, for some of you, that's uh, where the pages are still stuck together. Or like one guy says, the crispy part of your Bible. <laughs> so, John 14, 20, uh, Ezekiel 14, 21 and 22. It talks about the four severe judgments of the Lord. Uh, the sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence. These, these four severe judgments that are being released upon the earth. And then Ezekiel prophesies about this interesting group of people. It says that you will see this remnant. And here's what it says. It says you will see their life. It says you will see the way that they live. And it says, and, that, and when you see the way that they live in the midst of these uh, severe judgments, 
He says, then you will actually be comforted by the way that they live. I'll say this again. There is something that is coming on the earth that is troublesome in nature. And yet Jesus is teaching us, teaching disciples and teaching end time church, that there is a way in the grace of God to draw near to the Lord and have our hearts empowered to walk in righteousness, peace, and joy in the midst of the crisis. So that in the midst of the crisis, the, the, the unbelieving world looks and goes, hey, wait a minute, this thing is not impacting you guys on an emotional level. It might be impacting the same way on a physical level and all these different things. But, it's, but inwardly, this thing is having a whole different impact on you. What is your story? I think of First uh, uh, Peter where he says, always be ready to give an answer for your hope. It is one thing to go knocking on someone's door. It's a whole other thing to live in such a way people go, what's your deal? And that is part of where this is going for the end time church. And so paragraph F, so Jesus said that the purpose of his instruction was to equip the disciples to walk in victory under pressure. And there I got the verses there in John 15, John 16, and John, and John 16, 33 again. All right, let's go to page three. Page three. God, our dwelling place. So when we're talking about our hearts not being troubled, John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. He goes, believe in God, believe also in me. And I love the very next thing he says, in my father's house there are many mansions. I mean, isn't that the thing that we're looking for when we're weighed down with sorrow and concern? We want a quiet place to go and just be and rest and be comforted. To be taken care of, provided for, protected. That's the very, very thing that Jesus speaks of. He goes, I've made provision for your anxiety. And that is, I'm giving you access to my father's house. What is going on over here, I believe, is Jesus is... Building on a very important principle that we find in the Old Testament. And it was first introduced by the prophet Moses. In Psalm 90 verse 1, he says, You, Lord, you have been a, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. In other words, God, you have been our home. You have been the place where we live. You are our refuge. You are our fortress. You are our rock. You are our strong tower. All these uh, concepts we see in the Old Testament begins to suggest this idea that we live in God, that God becomes our home. Yeah, I love it. I got this in the next page, but I'm just in such a mood, so I'm just going to bring it to over this page. St. Augustine, he says that you made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. You made us for ourselves, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you, until you become the place where we live. And so Jesus, I believe, is building off that principle of God being our dwelling place. But here's, why, but here's why this is important. Because Moses was the first one to teach this principle, but he didn't just teach it just to anybody. He taught it to a very, very specific people, and that was he taught it to a people who were nomads, who were pilgrims walking throughout the wilderness. In other words, they did not have a permanent place to live. They were living in tents, and they were going from one place to another as the cloud would lead. And it is to this, these pilgrims, or more specifically, it's to these refugees. Remember, they were former slaves. They were in Egypt for 400 years 
um, under the heavy hand of Pharaoh. The mighty hand of the Lord delivers them through the ten plagues. And now these slaves, who already didn't really quite have a place of permanence, but they had somewhat as slaves, now they are refugees. They are migrants. There is, as it were, a immigration crisis, if you think about it, that was actually happening in the Exodus. I mean, three million people, three million former slaves leave Egypt in tents and are going from place to place in the desert. How many of you think that as human beings, which they were, they were really longing for a place of permanence? And it is to that group that Moses says, I have a revelation for you. He goes, I know It's been rough. I know it's been tough. I have a word for you. Thus says the Lord. He is our dwelling place. He is the one where we can actually find a place of permanence by interacting with him. And Jesus, I believe, is building off that principle. And this becomes very important as we're looking at John 14 in light of the context of end time pressures that will emerge. Paragraph B, John 14, it touches on understanding our access to the Father. John 14 shows us the the privilege, the the glory, the, uh, uh, the depth of relationship that we can have with the Father as seen in his relationship with his Son. It helps us understand our access to the Father in whom we dwell through mystical union by the Holy Spirit. It it is a spiritual union by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, he equips his disciples uh, for deep union with God. And that's what John 15 is about. But we're not talking about it today. Now, Jesus introduces this idea of the Father's house. This place in which we dwell. The place in which... We live. And I believe that there are three expressions of the Father's house. The first expression of the Father's house is the New Jerusalem. The Father's house. That Jesus prepared access to the Father's house uh, through the cross. That um, you and I can have access to his presence. Seated in heavenly places in this life and ultimately in the resurrection, living in the new Jerusalem. The writer of Hebrews talks about this company of people that were living their lives looking for the city which builder and architect was God. The Father's house, number one. Number two... Uh, this is it's it, this is where it's it's sorry it gets, it's, well, the whole thing is juicy but it gets a little more you know a little mufasa right is uh um the father's house is God himself God himself is the house in him we live in that mystical union you have become a dwelling place for us O oh God in every generation. Because the thing is in John 13 to 17 is Jesus is instructing us still about how to enter into that deep communion and union with the Father, Son, and with the Holy Spirit. And so yes, Jesus prepared the way for us to have access to the new Jerusalem. But he also prepared us that we might enter into that deep, the way to say it is that deep mystical union where we have spirit to spirit interaction with God by the Holy Spirit. But we can experience him, where we can experience his presence, his power, his love, his delight. You know, it says in Isaiah uh, 57, I'm going <laughs> Isaiah 57 verse uh, 15, it's right there in the notes. It's, this is what it says. It says, O you who inhabit eternity. Talking about the Lord. You who inhabit eternity. Eternity. Now check this out. How many of you agree that there's nothing greater than God? Right? Let me therefore suggest to you that when it says, O you who inhabit eternity, he's saying, O you God who indwells God. 
Because God is eternity. If eternity is said something other than God, then there is something greater than him. God is eternity. God dwells in God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are indwelled in one another in deep, perfect, filled with divine delight and joy and peace and commitment. And they're saying, we want human beings to come and dwell in us in the exact same way that we are dwelling in one another. And John 17 touches on this. I love it. It's like, I and them, you and me, them and us. I mean, it's like, oh, this is glorious just to think about this. He says, Father, I and them, you and me, them and us, that they may be made perfect in one. That the world may know that you have loved them in the exact same way that you have loved me. And that you sent me to the world. I mean, what a statement. And so the Father's house is God himself. The Father is the house. But I believe there's a third component of the Father's house. And it's us. John 14, 23. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandment and we will make our home with you. This is glorious. Not only are we in him as the father's house. No, the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, they long to come and make their dwelling in us. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6 talks about us as being the house of God whose house we are. Now, what's a home? A home is a context where we find nurture, identity, formation, affirmation, confirmation, provision, protection, belonging, community, discipline, (laughs) I got to put it in there. I got to come on over there. (laughs) These are dynamics that are greatly affected in a nomadic setting. When you, when when the the, the children of Israel, when they were going from place to place in their tent, uh, these things were greatly affected. The the sense of identity, formation, affirmation, confirmation, protection, all these become vulnerable when you are a nomadic person. The trends that Jesus highlights in Matthew 24, verse 7, will trigger a migration situation in the earth of historic proportions for believers and unbelievers. I'll say this again. The events that Jesus highlights in Matthew 24, verse 7. The events that are prophesied in the book of Revelation, in particular, Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 9, these events, they will trigger, beloved, a migration or an immigration crisis of epic historic proportions. If we think that there's an immigration crisis in the earth right now, wait until the fullness of the end time crisis is unleashed on the earth. There is yet coming a greater global eschatological migration crisis. Millions, if not billions, will be without a home or a homeland. And it's precisely in that context where the revelation of the Father is our dwelling place becomes essential. So this message of in my father's house, it is going to have vast implication for us here in America, Kansas City, got a decent AC going, nice little room. It, it, we cannot even fathom it. We, it cannot even enter into our brain. But when we actually look at the conditions of the end time scenario, it has to happen. There will come a 
epic, historic immigration crisis in the earth that the world has never seen. And think about it. If a third of the earth, the water turns into blood, you think Bubba is going to just hang out by bloody water? He's going to go, come on, sweetest, grab the kids. We got to go. We've got to go find a place where we can survive. A fourth of the earth dead because of wars. People are going to be migrating. Right now, in the earth, there are uh, 26 million refugees or, in, or internally displaced people. 26 million. And um, what makes these people refugees or uh, internally displaced is often a, um, a health crisis, uh, a war, or religious persecution where by one of those three elements, they are forced out from their place of living, their home, their homeland. They are forced to leave by themselves or to take their families with them and move on to another place where they can find refuge. Unfortunately, many of them find themselves in refugee camps. And these refugee camps, what they are, they are a holding pattern where, because here's the crazy thing, these refugee camps, they are in countries, but even though those refugee camps are in countries, the refugees are not citizens of that country at all. They are a people with no citizenship at all. No identity. No sense of stability, no sense of belonging, no sense of consistent community away from that which is familiar and away from that which is common and away oftentimes away from their loved ones, away from their language. But the point I'm making is that this is going to reach epic heights when we're looking at the end time scenario. And so the revelation of the Father as our dwelling place becomes absolutely essential. Paragraph E, the eschatological immigration crisis will be a great source of emotional trauma and crisis of meaning. Many will have their hearts filled with fear and anxiety. In 2020, uh, 2020, there were 7 million adults in America 7 million adults with general anxiety. There was another 6 million that suffered from, um, from anxiety or panic, uh, uh, sorry, from, from anxiety disorders. The age range most affected by this is the ages 14 to 16, uh, uh, 14 to 60. The studies also show this is intense. That in 2020 compared to 2019, that 62% of Americans had an increase of anxiety levels. 62%. And so it, it brings, and I, I don't say this with criticism, I say this with care and concern. It brings what Jesus said in, in, in John 14, it brings it really into view. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me, in my Father's house. There's many mansions. Let's go to page four. The Father's as the place of rest. The Father as the place of rest. Augustine of Hippo, you have made us for yourselves, O Lord, and our heart is restless. Until it rests in you. Uh, we are invited to dwell in God's presence by interacting with the Trinity. By the way, all this really just comes down to two things. It comes down to talking to God often and obeying his word. The way that we live in the Father's house and the way we experience uh, the power of being in his house is by talking to him often receiving of his love, loving and loving him back through our loving obedience. 
paragraph C, in John 14, Jesus in great detail answers four essential questions. What's amazing about John 14 is that the entire teaching of Jesus to his disciples was Jesus answering four very specific questions. Question number one was the question of resolve. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. It was the question of resolve. In other words, I have what it takes. And the Lord goes, no, you don't. (laughs) He goes, no, you don't. Lesson number one, Peter, no, you don't. You don't have what it takes. I am the one that's going to prepare a place for you. You don't have what it takes. Question number two is what do we do? Now that we know that you have made a place for us in the Father's house, he goes, what do we do? Here's the question. The Thomas said to the Lord, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus answers that. I'll look at that in just a few moments. The third question is the question of satisfaction or the question of rest or the question of fulfillment. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. The question of satisfaction, completion, belonging. Fourth question is the question of encounter. Jude is not as scary. He said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And so the first question, Jesus answers Peter and the disciples um, about their future relationship with the Father. And he assures them that through the cross, he has, he has secured uh, their relationship with the Father and they have secured their, uh, their access and their dwelling in the new Jerusalem in the age to come. Paragraph E, the second question, the question of what do we do? Lord, we don't know where you're going. Where are you going? Why can't we know the way? Paragraph E, Jesus teaches that he himself is three things, that he's the pattern, the quality, and the source. In other words, he is the pattern, he's the way. In other words, in his humanity, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, but in his humanity, he was the way, the model, the pattern of how God wants to interact with us as human beings. In other words, the measure of access that Jesus in his humanity on the earth had to the Father in relation with the Father, that is the exact same access and relationship that's available to you and I. Some of you just about fell over in your chair, and I get it. Which is why Jesus says on multiple locations in John 14, he goes, believe me when I tell you this. He goes, believe me when I tell you this. Believe me when I tell you this. That's why he starts out in John 14 verse 1. He goes, believe in God, believe also in me. He's not repeating himself. He's not saying believe in God, believe in God. He said, though he is God, he's saying believe in God and believe in me as a man and what I'm about to tell you about the relationship that's available to you with the Father because it is the exact same relationship that I have with him in this life. He says, believe me when I tell you this. And so he says, I'm the way, number one. Number two, I'm the truth. I'm the, the quality, the, the, the quality of relationship that you see me have with the Father. It is that same quality of relationship that's available to you. And thirdly, he says, I am the life. In other words, I'm the source. That the very life-giving power of God is what I release in your life and your soul. We call it the grace of God. Third question. It's a question of, said the worship team come up. It's the question of satisfaction. In John 14, verses 8 to 21, Jesus answers the question of satisfaction by teaching on the union that is available to us. That the spirit of the Father and the grace for obedient love and the gospel and gospel impact through the power of God. He addresses the issue of intimacy with God 
being empowered by the grace of God, and that he wants to give us an anointing to actually have impact in the gospel, John 14, 12, called greater works than these shall you do for those who believe. Last question. It's a question of encounter. In John 14, 22 to 31, Jesus teaches on the role of the Holy Spirit who brings us into the experience of knowing God. Amen? All right, I just want to invite you to stand. Lord, we love you. Let's just uh, stand before the Lord and enter, just lead us in worship. Here we are, Lord. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Father, that you are our dwelling place. You, Father, are the place where we want to live. So Jesus in John 14, he says that the Holy Spirit was going to come. And one of his main objectives was to teach us about what Jesus instructed us in John 14. The Holy Spirit teach us. The anointing that abides in us. Teach us. Teach us, Lord. Teach us how to relate with the Father. Teach us how the Father wants to relate with us. Teach us about his love. Teach us about his power. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Open our eyes, Lord. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Jesus. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart. Reach a fire in our hearts. Reach a fire in our hearts, Lord. Right now, Lord. More of your presence and your fire. 
Touching you, like you like to see prayer. So I want to invite you to come to the front. You just feel like the Lord is just touching in any way.